Coming up on Bike Week, the Supercross season gets underway. When the gate drops for the 250 main event, one rider who is proclaimed by all to be king of Supercross will be absent. He was at Anaheim, but not to race. Jeremy McGrath announces his retirement. And you wanted to say? I think war almost never produces money. As European dirt bikes ruled the off-road market, now there is one. It's next on Bike Week. I'm Larry Myers. Welcome to Bike Week and welcome to Amherst, Ohio, the American home of KTM Sport Motorcycles. Now, first on Bike Week, a history lesson. This is the motorcycle that revolutionized the off-road industry in terms of lightweight racing. It was designed and imported by John Penton. And when I say this is a motorcycle, I mean this is the motorcycle, serial number 001. It belongs to a local rider, Norm Miller, who graciously loaned it to us. Now, there was no shortage of dirt bikes back then. Brands such as Mako, Full Taco, Greaves, Husqvarna, and others, all from Europe, could be found in the woods and motocross tracks of the world. Eventually, those brands disappeared from the scene as the Japanese companies impacted the U.S. market. Now, the Penton motorcycle, however, now cleverly disguised as a KTM, is not only still around, but is growing in size and market share. A reasonable question might be, how did they survive the Japanese juggernaut? Here's the KTM story. It begins with a Penton motorcycle. Now, the idea for that machine was born in 1962. John Penton, one of the top off-road riders in the country, having made his mark while riding in NSU, had caught the attention of the BMW Motorcycle Factory by setting a coast-to-coast -coast record on a BMW motorcycle and by winning several national championship enduros also on a BMW. And the factory invited John to Germany to ride the international six-day trial. And despite never having ridden six days, John earned a silver medal. More importantly, a seed was planted in John's mind. I saw all these lightweight motorcycles and how they would compete and go through the woods. And my first thought was that, boy, if we could have a, a competitive lightweight motorcycle like that in, in America, it would be a wonderful starter for young people to start riding off the road. For the next five years, John thought more and more about the lightweight European small bore bikes. 1967, when he was granted the East Coast Husqvarna distributorship, he thought he had it all figured out. He asked Husky to sleeve down a 175cc engine and put the result in a strong, lightweight 250 motocross frame. Now, with a few minor adjustments, John felt he would have a winner. They responded by saying that people in America, they like big things, and uh, they wouldn't want a 125. The International Six Days Trial was in Poland that year. After riding it, John, on the advice of a friend, traveled to Matikopen, Austria, where he met Eric Trunkenfolds, who owned the KTM factory. John outlined his idea to build a lightweight motorcycle for America and once again was rejected. Mr. Trunkenfolds told me we uh, build bicycles and mopeds. We did build motorcycles, but we're not interested in it, the market anymore. When John offered Eric $6,000 to build a couple of prototypes to his specs, Eric Trunkenfolds changed his mind. The Penton 125 was born, and so was the American lightweight off-road market. From the beginning, the 125 Penton with a Sax engine was a hit, and not just with younger riders. In fact, most of the machines he sold went to experienced riders that initially rode the 125s like they rode their 250s. They rode them hard, wrung them out, and found the weak points. John's sons, nephews, and friends made up the biggest field of test riders in the industry. When we return, Penton survives a decline of the European dirt bike market.
Welcome back to Bike Week as we rejoin the Penton KTM story. From the very, very beginning, that's what we were always doing, you know, back even in the, in the late 60s. Uh, I was always trying to make the thing last, and, and doing work like that was not, again, it wasn't work. It was just what we did. We went out and rode, something broke, and uh, that week we'd fix that, and next week something else had happened. So we were just always working on the bikes. Things like the folding shift lever, which seems so common. I mean, those, those items today are just there on the bike, but uh, we would always bend those. They didn't, they didn't fold back, and uh, somebody got the brilliant idea of making them fold back and put a little rubber band up there to the front. And um, very crude, but it worked. And within simply weeks, uh, they would take that and find a way to manufacture it and put it on the motorcycle. So we were changing the motorcycles uh, literally in weeks and days, uh, one of the real fun part about being a, a Penton dealer back in the old days was every single motorcycle you got from every shipment had some improvement on it. There wasn't a model year, it was just uh, the newest and latest greatest thing that we could fix came on the bike automatically as soon as we could fix it. As was noted earlier, when the Penton 125 broke into the marketplace, there were several European manufacturers already there. Like Mako, Multaco, Husqvarna, Greaves, Pook, and CZ, all would eventually give way to the aggressive Japanese brands, all except one, Penton. It might well have been John's approach to manufacturing and selling the best off-road motorcycle in the world that allowed sales to increase while other brands were on the way out. John did not have a degree in engineering. His theory, based on experience, was to find the best aftermarket parts in the world, put them all on the same bike, then modify what didn't work until it did. I think a lot of the companies over in Europe, like Husqvarna and Mako and Voltaco, tried to compete with the Japanese instead of taking on an image of being like a boutique bike, because they had fans, and there's some people who just aren't going to ride Japanese. KTM sort of looked inward and tried to become a European brand and kind of keep that brand awareness, like they were the Austrian underdog. Instead of taking on the Japanese, they just did their own thing for long enough to where people actually started noticing what they were doing and figured out that you know, just because the bike wasn't Japanese made didn't mean it didn't have that same racing quality. Exactly, exactly. Every About every innovation we had on that bike was to make it better, all the way from the wheel rims to the shifting levers, and believe it or not, the first bikes that came in here from Europe didn't even have folding foot levers on them. So it, it, we, had to, we had to do this to be competitive. That was, that was what really built the bike. John Penton designed it and KTM manufactured it. The motorcycle that revolutionized the U.S. lightweight racing market. In 1977, motorcycle sales were in a slump and the U.S. dollar was devalued. The result forced John Penton to sell his distribution business to KTM, who would in turn remove the Penton name from the motorcycle. More when we return. One by one, the next few years saw the demise of the U.S.-European dirt bike importers. Only the Penton, by then known as KTM, survived. A major part of that survival could be laid on the shoulders of Rod Bush. Now, Rod was a high school classmate of Jack Penton, a motorcycle racer, and eventually an employee of Penton Imports. When Penton and KTM split, Rod was asked to join KTM America. First, I was the technical service manager for the company, later a regional sales manager for the company, and eventually the national sales manager for the company, for, for KTM in the U.S. And just a steady progression up, up through the company in various different areas. It, it seemed natural to me to make that progression. That's, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, as I said, I had a passion for the product and, and a, a good association with our customers, with our dealers developed from a grassroots level. By 1987, Rod was president of KTM America, a company originally founded by a dirt bike enthusiast was now being run by a dirt bike enthusiast. And as it turns out, run very well. 
Again, I'll point out, instead of faulting like the mass of European dirt bike companies, KTM is in the midst of tremendous sales success. When I took that position as president, it, it was a vision, uh, and, and I believed it. I don't think too many people around me believed it at the time. But gradually, as I attracted uh, other people into the company uh, that, that had a similar vision to mine, is Scott Harden, Savaraj Narayanam, uh, guys from Scott came from the Husky uh, world and Sal came from the Mako world and we knew what the opportunities were uh, and we also had more experience in the off-road motorcycle business and particularly with the European brand than probably any other three guys you could put together and and we did to start to develop a vision of, of a tremendous growth like we have now. KTM's heritage comes from off-road racing going back to the Penton days We've specialized in it over the years. We were actually a niche marketing company that forged our reputation in that market. We build bikes specific for the market. We don't make one model to fit all the categories. We make models specific for each category. And I think the biggest underlying factor in our success is the fact that enthusiasts run the company. True off-road riders and people that have been involved in the sport all their lives are actually making the decisions of how our products are being built. And our market research is uh, three steps ahead of the rest of the competition because of our closeness to the market. If I look now, we're at about a 15% share of the off-road competition segment. Uh, I believe we can continue to grow that. Uh, we've recently gone by Suzuki and market share in, in off-road competition motorcycles. We're closing in on Kawasaki. Our goal is to be the, the off-road, the leader in market share in the off-road market segment. So we, we've got a long way to go. We're not probably a house, certainly not a household name, certainly not the first manufacturer you get to know when you entered the market. And so over the years, KTM has probably been more known within the off-road circles, enduro, desert, cross country. Within the last four years though, KTM's made major strides forward in the market in general, through our branding activities with our youth programs and our sport mini cycle line and then our introduction in, uh, into supercross and motocross racing U.S. national level it's really uh, taking KTM at the all new level of awareness within the, within the market as a whole. Welcome back. It's apparent there is no single answer to the question, how has KTM not only survived, but enjoys unprecedented growth while the rest of the European dirt bike manufacturers are either out of the business or like Husky, still around, but not a factor in the market. KTM moved into new facilities in 1998 and has expanded twice since then. Employees on the West Coast are looking forward to a new and larger building complete with an on-site test track that is scheduled for completion in late 2003. In 1985, there were 15 employees. Today, there are in excess of 80. To maintain this remarkable growth, KTM, once considered a dirt bike only company, is headed for a line of street machines. The road market's just a whole other, uh, you know, untapped opportunity for KTM. And if we apply the same principles that we use in developing the, the off road motorcycles into our street motorcycles, there's no doubt in my mind that it'll be very successful. And based on what I've seen so far and at the Intermont show recently held in Munich, uh, KTM is well on the way to, to doing just that. Among other things at the Intermont show, Scott saw a 950cc V-twin called the Adventure. Available in 2003, the Adventure is a dual sport version of the off-road rally KTM that won Paris to Dakar in 2002. In other words, build a successful race bike and modify it for road use. In 2003, KTM will enter the World Championship Grand Prix Wars with a factory entry in the 125 GP class. By 2005, a MotoGP team will carry the KTM banner. KTM street market is not far off. Meanwhile, here in the States, off-road promotions are KTM's bread and butter. Mike Laffer has recently won his fifth National Enduro crown and will be on the Big Orange through at least 2003. In 1997, KTM made a big Supercross splash with their KTM Junior Supercross Challenge. 
They'll continue that program as well as round out their mini bike line with an all new 85cc motocrosser. In 125 Supercross, KTM will sponsor five riders, three in the west, two in the east. Grant Langston has switched from the 125 class to the 250s. He'll debut an all new machine at the Anaheim opener. All that takes money. Red Bull is a major outside sponsor, and there are several other smaller sponsors. KTM, though, puts out the major share. We know if we're going to come out here and if we're going to be competitive, we just can't come out here on a shoestring budget. We know racing is expensive, and there's a lot of value to racing. You know, what we have uh, what we learned from racing goes a lot quicker, I believe, into our next year's production bikes than you see on other models. And uh, with it, so we see the benefit of racing, and we know that there's a cost to that success, and that's development that we learned. The greatest Supercross rider in history, Jeremy McGrath, was scheduled to compete in the 2003 season aboard a KTM. In a recent press conference, Jeremy announced his decision to retire. Later in the show, we'll talk to Jeremy. Right now, the Supercross season is about to get underway. The 2003 Supercross season began in front of a sold-out crowd at Edison Field in Anaheim. Fans who came to say farewell to a legend and ring in the new year. More on the farewell later. The 125 main event was a thriller in the making as defending West champ Travis Preston followed teammate Chris Gossler away while fan favorite James Stewart was clogged up tight in traffic. Preston moved past Gossler into the lead by the fourth lap, and while Bubba Stewart was a long way back, he was making some progress in that direction. All eyes were on Stewart as he was putting on a show, eventually making his way up to second place by the time the race was at its end. But there was no catching the number one. I started thinking a little bit, you know, like halfway through, you know, I don't want to crash, but uh, I pulled myself together at the end and stayed focused. So I can't wait for next week, and I learned some stuff tonight, so I think next weekend's going to be better. 125 results are presented by Victory, the new American motorcycle. Travis Preston opens his 2003 account with a win. Stewart has yet to win a race at Edison Field. Early leader Gossler ended up fourth. When we come back, Jeremy McGrath's press conference. Welcome back. Did you know that Jeremy McGrath's first and last Supercross main event wins were in Anaheim? Well, here's Brian Drebber with this year's Supercross season opener. The site, Anaheim. <laughs> 